I just want to start off by really thanking Simon and the team, including Simon Enright, who is here as well, I think, in the audience, for the way that the long-term plan was produced and delivered. I think it, you know, it's, it's a fantastic... I, d I don't think there's any other, any other health system in the world that could produce a report like this, actually, speaking for the whole of the health system. Um, so I think it was, was you know, congratulations, Simon, to you and, and actually all the team and all the many hours that went into producing it. Interestingly, I, I, in, in my report, I just say I had just two visits I just would mention. Um, one was to South Yorkshire and one to Manchester. And very interesting talking, particularly in, in primary care there, just the extent to which the long-term plan is actually, you know, this is not just a plan, this is actually working, you know, coming out of the five-year forward view, what, five, well, nearly five years ago. Actually, on the ground, there's a lot happening and a lot of enthusiasm for it. I mean, interesting, um, Nikki's in the audience as well today, but um, going to Steve Kell's practice in, in South Yorkshire, you know, seeing, you know, they've got three paramedics, they've got pharmacists, they've got arranged with the local care homes. In a way, would that would look to me like the future of primary care? which we're going to talk about in detail a bit later uh, with Ian and, and Richard from the GPs, from the BMA, part of the GPs, who's going to be here as well talking about that. But also it's happening in Manchester. I was very struck in Manchester how the social determinants of care are really a driving force there, that, you know, whereas it is still very important about the sort of the more acute-based targets that we have, but a lot of the work they're doing on the ground around prevention is, is starting to bear fruit. So in both those visits, it was really reinforcing of everything that was in the, in the long-term plan. And then the other thing I just mentioned is that in December, we com oh, I say the gel completed the, the sequencing of 100,000 whole genomes. And in the same month, um, NHS England commissioned <coughs> the first CAR T-cell therapies at Great Ormond Street for five children. And that really has got the attention of the world. I went to the J.P. Morgan conference um, for the Office of Life Sciences and actually far from us having to try and get their attention of the pharmaceutical work, they are beating a path to our door for the work that we're doing in genomic but also seeing that the NHS is at the, the forefront of commissioning and coming up with ideas of how we price some of these new therapies. So I thought that was really interesting and going to Manchester not only did I see um, some really interesting work going on the ground in primary care, but also the genomics facility at the Manchester Royal Infirmary is doing some fantastic work. So it's that sort of in the same integrated care system in Manchester, you see on the ground work going on as well as world-class sort of genomic medicine at the same time. So that was really interesting. So that's really all I was going to say by way of my report, Simon. So over to you. Uh, thank you. I'll uh, uh, just add very briefly to that particularly uh, thanking all of our teams who are at the moment working on the oversight of the uh, pressures that are in the NHS for winter, and we'll hear from uh, Pauline and uh, Matthew on that. There's a big job of work to uh, finish the 18-19 uh, uh, financial year and prepare for next year as the first year of implementation of the uh, long-term plan. Uh, we may want to touch on the work uh, underway on Brexit contingency planning, uh, an enormous uh, effort going on, uh, several hundred people uh, assigned uh, to that uh, task. But specifically, uh, today we are going to be addressing the first pillar of implementation of the long-term plan, as you say, David, through the uh, new GP contract and the primary care networks, and I would uh, echo your thanks to our team and also to uh, Richard uh, Bortry and the uh, GPC for the uh, constructive way in which we've been able to work together uh, on that. Uh, we uh, Just two other things to, to say. We have been invited by the uh, Health Committee and by Government to put together more detailed proposals on the legislation that we uh, prefigured in the long-term plan. And so uh, those proposals will be issued for engagement across the health service and more widely uh, in uh, the month of February, uh, which I guess begins tomorrow. Um, is it tomorrow? Uh, and similarly, we will be 
advertising <coughs> co-chairs of the NHS Assembly uh, within the next couple of weeks. So we're going to have obviously a detailed conversation around a lot of those things uh, in the months to come, but uh, just those will have uh, been kicked off between now and our next public board meeting. Thank you. Um, excellent. Did any, any, any one want to come? Um, Noel and Joanne, you both went on a visit up to Yorkshire, as well, Leeds, I think, didn't you, to look at integrated care there? Do you have any reflections on that? Uh, we did. We went to both uh, Leeds to understand how um, a lot of technology we've delivered over the last five years is being delivered into acute settings and outpatients. And then we went to Wakefield by design to understand how ICSs are coming together in some of our uh, less privileged parts of the country. Um, it was quite an extraordinary vis visit. Um, we didn't anticipate uh, seeing quite as much in the way of innovation and delivery and practical solu practical solutions as we saw. But I was particularly, I don't know what Joanne thinks, I was particularly impressed with the way the ICSs are coming together and the cohesion around the management team was, I thought, quite extraordinary. Well, I, as well as echoing that, I just I would like to mention Dorset because there was another visit to Dorset in the last um, couple of weeks and uh, where we saw in a very different part of the country um, a, a vision of, of integrated care coming together. And I, I think one of the standouts of that particular visit was sitting in a room with um, community nurses, uh, representatives of, um, the, uh, of acute care and the local authority, um, with the GPs um, dialing in to talk through individual patients who are um, vulnerable and who are uh, need a, a care from a number of different sources. And those people you know, getting that from um, an integrated collective view with all the right people in the room and people who knew them and um, were able to provide exactly the care that they needed in the most effective way. So that, that was an extremely powerful experience. I think also, I mean, I was there in, in Dorset, um, the strength of the relationships and the trust that's being built locally was demonstrable to everybody. And, and the care in which people were putting to really finding solutions to what often are very vulnerable people. I think we're going to come more on when we get onto the new GP contract, how you know, the primary care is absolutely the mm. heart. I think the other thing, David, from, from that was just, obviously, you've got the Bournemouth and Poole reconfiguration, which I think has been going for 10 years. And, and I think one of the things we have to do is and think about is how can we help local systems where they're making the right clinical decisions and the right sort of decisions for their populations find a way to do some of those things a bit quicker? Yeah. So I, I just, if I could just add to that, while I was in Dorset, I had a... Um, an opportunity to have an impromptu focus group at the railway station with a, <laughs> with five very voluble um, members of the uh, the Pool <coughs> Towns Women's Guild, um, who were um, I think very kindly um, talking to me about their views of their local health system, and you know, it was clear that the that what was happening in relation to the hospitals was really sort of top of mind, and being able to make those things happen is is going to be very important. I see that Bren, Bren is in the audience, I see back there, and I'm going to be spending a day in Gloucestershire with Bren, seeing how the, the, the voluntary sector on the ground can really contribute to this as well, and how that is tied into the primary care system as well is really important. Excellent. So, shall we move on to the CCG allocations, Matt? Thank you, Chair. Um, so, we've obviously... Uh, discussed uh, the disposition of resources for 1920 and the following four years in some detail in board committees uh, previously um, but we will uh, give final sign I'll be recommending final sign off of those uh, proposals by the board today uh, the paper um, that we have before us starts <coughs> by confirming uh, the final settlement agreed with the government for the uh, five-year period um, as, as you'll recall, there were changes in the uh, GDP deflators which required some adjustments to be made uh, to the settlement, but we have now uh, have, the, have the final numbers before us, um, uh, as a consequence of which the real terms growth rate over the five years uh, remains at 3.4%, uh, with a profile of 3.6%, 3.1%, 3%, 3%, 4.1% as set out in the table. Um, on page uh, three of the paper or page 11 of the uh, board pack. 
um, uh, the paper um, uh, then goes on to uh, it, it starts by setting out how we will distribute those resources to the different uh, aspects uh, of our commissioning uh, of our commissioning operations and the, the starting point for that is to is to ensure that we fund a realistic and sustainable level of activity uh, for all of our commissioning streams whether that's via uh, CCGs uh, or through specialized commissioning or our other direct commissioning functions we principally do that by looking at uh, the levels of growth uh, over the recent past and making adjustments for what we know uh, about population growth and other factors uh, going forward. Um, we then take into account the price pressures that we know the system will face uh, over the coming period. Um, and in particular, uh, there are some significant uh, movements um, over this period, so uh, very significant pay awards in 2018-19 uh, are reflected in the allocations for 2019-20 uh, and some movements in the provider sustainability fund uh, which i'll come on to uh, a little later crucially as well we have protected funding for the implementation of, of existing five-year forward view commitments particularly in respect of mental health primary care and cancer services and those of course will form the foundation for the commitments in the long-term plan to be delivered over the remainder of the period um, we have also um, incorporated uh, our assumptions in terms of continuing uh, challenge to all of us in terms of running uh, the system with uh, reduced running costs and prioritizing, prioritizing funding for frontline uh, patient care as far as possible. And we've also uh, made provision for uh, some uh, particular risk uh, that we face over this period around income from the voluntary and statutory schemes for regulating the prices of branded medicines. In particular, uh, I mentioned uh, protecting commitments from the five-year uh, forward view. Uh, we have also uh, ensured that we've made provision to deliver on the commitments in the long-term plan around increasing the share of spend on mental health and also increasing the share, um, the historic commitments to increase the share of spend going on both primary medical and community health services uh, over the period. And those significant commit commitments are uh, fully funded in the proposals that the board has before it today. Um, in terms of uh, then how uh, what what those sort of principles uh, lead to in terms of an allocation of uh, resources, Table Two on page five uh, sets that out in uh, in headline terms. Um, I think uh, what's um, you'll see that uh, overall CCG uh, program spend uh, is projected to grow by 5.7% uh, in 1920. In As I mentioned earlier, the, um, a significant chunk of that is to, de is to deliver funding for the pay increases uh, that were funded centrally in 2018-19. Uh, the uh, other aspects of that table that I would draw the board's attention to um, are the movements in respect of provider support set out in that table. So uh, you'll see um, that as we have announced uh, in the planning guidance uh, jointly between NHS England and NHS Improvement, there's a significant reduction in the provider sustainability fund. Uh, in part due to a transfer of some of those resources into core prices for urgent and emergency care uh, services, um, but also to reflect uh, over the period the introduction of the Financial Recovery Fund, uh, which is a significant and decisive move to provide support directly to uh, provider organisations who have plans in place uh, to deliver sustainable cost reductions over the five-year period uh, and to eliminate, def uh, eliminate operating deficits uh, over that period, and uh, those those mo movements are reflected uh, in in the allocation of resources in Table Two. Um, as a result of that, uh, of course, uh, it's important to note that we are not holding significant central provision uh, for um, levels of uh, deficit anywhere in the system um, beyond that. You know, this is a this is a change in the approach to directly support organisations who are delivering improvements in their um, uh, in their efficiency um, over the period, rather than holding back uh, large reserves centrally in order to offset subsequent deficits. Um, so those are the headlines in terms of the overall disposition of resources. I'll turn now to the specifics around uh, CCG allocations, which again we've discussed uh, in, in, in board committees previously. And as colleagues will know, uh, we work uh, on the basis of recommendations from ACRA, an independent expert committee chaired by Professor Peter Smith. 
um, who have made a series of recommendations uh, which we propose um, to accept uh, around the uh, composition of the target formula for CCG uh, resources. And I think the board will wish to thank Professor Smith uh, and all members of ACRA uh, for their advice. The annex uh, to the paper contains the letter from uh, uh, from Professor Smith recording those uh, recommendations. And I'll just run through the headlines of that because I think there were some very uh, important and welcome uh, developments that we were able to uh, recommend to the board um, this uh, for the allocations over this period. Firstly, um, on population, I think the um, there are two changes uh, that I would uh, draw the board's attention to, set out in paragraph uh, 22. Uh, the first is a, is a change... Um, uh, in order that we will, rather than looking at the uh, list, uh, the size of the sort of patient list of a general practice, which is the sort of building block of the population component of the formula, uh, at, a, at a fixed point in time, we'll now look at the annual average uh, of the registered list for the most recent year. And that means that we'll be better picking up um, cyclical patterns of population movements um, in local areas. And again, I think that's a, that's a welcome change. And we also now have from the Office of National Statistics uh, much more specific population projections which take account uh, of both age and gender, uh, and we propose to reflect those uh, in the formula going forward. Um, we've also um, had uh, we also have a big step forward on the approach we take to um, estimating relative need for community health services. Um, heretofore, we haven't had a separate formula uh, for community services because we haven't had the data that has allowed us to uh, develop one. But thanks to the commitment uh, and hard work of community services providers uh, up and down the land, uh, we are now starting to get early returns from a new community services data set. Um, and taking those early returns together with more detailed patient-level data from a small number, uh, from a handful of local areas, uh, we've been able to develop uh, a specific uh, formula for relative need for community health services. And again, we, uh, on, based on ACRA's advice, we are recommending that we adopt that formula um, as set out in the paper for 1920 um, and beyond. Um, this, uh, in particular, uh, reflects higher need for community services in areas that have high uh, high proportions of people aged over 85, uh, particularly in rural and coastal CCGs, when you look at the national distribution of that population, but also importantly in some of the in some deprived older populations in the Midlands and the North, in particular. Um, it's a big step forward to have a specific formula for community services, um, and uh, but it's not the end of the story, and we hope to continue work as the data quality. Uh, improves and as we get a more comprehensive national data set we will continue our work to refine that formula going forward. Um, we've also been able to make improvements to the mental health uh, formula um, and again the, 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 the thing that's enabled us to do that is better data coming forward in particular from uh, IAPT uh, activity collections um, uh, and again um, we have uh, we propose to implement that those improvements to the formula that results in higher need indices for some coastal areas and areas with older populations uh, due in the main to the fact that we now uh, all the work that's gone into better Better diagnosis and recording of dementia uh, is now coming through in the, in the national data and will now be reflected in the allocation of resources. On health inequalities, which of course uh, is something that the board has always uh, taken very seriously uh, in considering the approach it takes to the allocation of resources, um, we um, based on ACRA's advice, uh, are recommend, recommending that we continue to use uh, the, uh, the same measure for the adjustments that we make for health inequalities and unmet need. Um, but ACRA have recommended to, uh, to us improvements in the way that we, um, in the way, the way we translate that data uh, into the allocation formula. Uh, which um, is taking better account in particular of, of, of the areas with the most uh, extreme uh, levels of unmet need, the sort of outliers uh, on, the, uh, on the spectrum. Um, and uh, again, we are proposing to accept ACRA's recommended changes there. Um, and it's worth noting that that leads to some significant uh, increases in funding for some areas of the country, Blackpool, uh, CCG's core target allocation, 
uh, increases by 5.13% uh, as set out in paragraph uh, 34 of the paper. Um, uh, but that's, um, uh, as I say, we're on the basis of ACWA's advice, we're recommending those uh, improvements. And I think, again, it's a welcome refinement of the approach uh, that the board takes to allocations. Um, aside from that, we are um, recommending that we continue uh, with the same uh, weightings for the health inequalities adjustment that we've used in the past. That's a 15% adjustment for primary care, a 10% adjustment for CCG commission services, and a 5% adjustment for specialised services. Um, we have set out in the long-term plan that we will commission ACRA, um, the advisory committee, to conduct and publish further work on the inequalities adjustment so that we can continue our commitment to um, uh, improving and refining uh, the approach we take to reflecting unmet need in our location. Can I just hold you there, Matt? I'll just maybe ask you, or maybe Simon, just to sort of, in layman's speak, just characterise the the aggregate difference about where the how where the money flows and to what kind of populations are going to receive more and which will receive less. Can you sort of give a flavour of it? Sure. So I, I I think the main. Uh, the, 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 main, the, main, the main changes in distribution, as I said, are driven by the, uh, the new community services formula and the new mental health formula and the changes in, uh, uh, the, changes in the way we take account um, of inequalities. And in terms of the, um, the impact that has uh, in, kind of in, pa in pounds, billion terms, by the end of the period, we expect that there'll be, a, there'll be uh, it's 2.2 .2 billion <coughs> pounds will be redistributed within target uh, allocations. Um, I move from one part of the distribution to another to reflect levels of health inequalities. Um, on the, um, as I said, the community services changes to the community services uh, formula um, have in particular uh, moved resources to areas with higher levels of uh, population over 85. Um, it's coastal areas and some rural areas that sort of stand out from the map as having benefited most significantly from those changes. Um, uh, uh, and other areas, as I say, with, uh, with high levels of population over 85. In the mental, um, changes in the mental health formula, um, uh, what you see is, um, a, a, as, you'd ex as you'd perhaps expect, that some of the uh, deprived inner city, area, inner city areas have seen the biggest changes in their need index. Do you want to add to that, Simon? Or? Well, everybody is gaining on the back of this because obviously we're talking about a twenty and a half billion pounds real terms increase uh, in uh, over phased over five years. Uh, what this is doing is changing the fair shares targets, and then we have a pace of change as to how quickly we can get to those targets. One of the decisions before us this morning is: should we ensure, as of April first, that no part of the country is more than 5% below its fair share formula. We've managed to achieve that in the past. Obviously, a new formula means you get a new distribution of starting positions. Our proposition is that we should move immediately to ensure that everybody is within that, uh, within that banding. And I think, in all, uh, in all honesty, we can say that since uh, the approach to trying to allocate funding based on need began in the National Health Service in 1976. Uh, this will be the fairest and most precise allocation of the growing resources that the NHS has ever seen. Okay, well that's, thank you. <laughs> that's very clear. Um, and we wanted to hear, yeah, that's absolutely right. And actually, in terms of tackling um, health inequalities, this is fundamental to doing that, really. Is, particularly when linked to the um, long-term plan requirements that local areas will have to show how the extra money that is being deployed for health inequalities is actually funding services or interventions that will narrow those inequalities. It's one thing just to have the funding in your overall pot, but unless you can actually show the chain of connection to what's going to make a difference in the way that uh, Michelle and uh, Victor have previously pointed out, the need to hardwire inequalities reductions into all of the local plans that people are going to be developing between now and the autumn, as well as the national programmes, that's the point that we've got to uh, stress, and that will be different than what has gone before. Thank you. Matt, anything else you wanted to add? Um, uh, Simon, Simon has mentioned, as I say, that we're, we're, we are uh, continuing the approach of bringing all areas to within 5% of targets. Um, and in fact, by the end of the period, we're able to bring um, uh, or no CCD will be more than 3.5% below target by 23-24. Uh, um, 
I think the only other thing I'd add in terms of the approach we've taken to the sort of pace at which uh, uh, the new target allocations are actually sort of uh, in, reflected in actual allocations on the ground is that we've provided uh, we've made provisions for a higher floor allocation, so the minimum allocation for programme growth that any CCG will receive um, is higher uh, over this five-year period than it has been uh, in, in, um, in the approaches we've taken previously, and that reflects the, um, the sort of price pressures that are coming through the system, but also the significant expectations in terms of new deliverables coming out of the five-year forward view and the long-term plan. Um, and I think... I can probably leave it there. Okay. Um, the, only, the, the only thing I'd add finally is I mentioned ACRA uh, as the advisory committee and our, our gratitude to them for their work. Um, we are also, um, uh, we will be setting out ACRA's work program for the, uh, for, the next, uh, for the next round of allocations and I'd encourage uh, everyone across the NHS uh, and those uh, listening and watching to today's meeting uh, to um, provide input to ACRA on their future work program, uh, whether it's um, areas that re of refinement they would recommend um, because we want to make sure that we're drawing on that uh, input as we, as we consider further changes to the formula for future years. Excellent. Any, uh, yeah, Richard. Three, three observations, David. And first of all, I think the balance of this feels right in terms of making sure everyone's got enough growth to do the things that we're asking them to do, but that the, there is additional growth then targeted at the areas of greatest need. So I think that difficult balance between stability and change, I think this feels right looking at it. Second thing is there's, there's an awful lot of change going on below this paper. If you look at what's happened on provider sustainability on community services, on mental health services, on the overall fund, there's a lot of things changing here. Um, and I hope that following on from this, we can, we can sort of move on from some of the arguments about distribution and say, actually, we've got the money sorted out distributionally broadly in the right way, now let's get on and think about how we actually use it rather than spend too much more time arguing about distribution. Um, and the third thing on the provider side, I, I welcome the shift towards sort of recognising what we need to put in realistically to give the providers chance to deliver the things that we need them to do. Um, I welcome the fact that we're not holding back contingencies just to release later on in the year when problems emerge. Um, but it's important, conversely on that, that actually people then deliver against realistic plans, because if they don't, all we can do is go back and cut someone else. So I think the balance of the deal on saying we've set you realistic, set realistic expectations from you, but actually now we've really got to make sure we deliver on those. Yeah. Well, that point is very well made. Anyone else got any to raise? Well, I think. Uh, I just, I just add, we obviously targeted this quite extensively at the commissioning committee over the last quarter of last year. And I felt, I just want to commend the team for both the team and ACRA for really moving on and modernizing NHS in terms of accepting, looking at large scale data, thinking about how we address deprivation and things. So I think really well done by the team. Yeah, it's one, it's one, it's one of those rather arcane parts of. Mm medicine which are or, or a care system which is hugely important so matt thank you very much and thanks so we can prove the paper move on hmm? yeah good thank you very much that is half a trillion pounds of public money that we've just allocated uh, yeah. yeah 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 excellent um ian i think we're going to move on to the where you got to with the gp contract and will you introduce richard for us please Great, thank you very much, uh, Mr. <coughs> Chair, and welcome um, Dr. Richard Vautry, who is the, uh, the chair of uh, the BMA General Practitioners Committee in England. Um, so last summer, uh, when Richard and I started discussions, we had a choice. We could either continue the annual round of contract discussions, or we could be a bit more imaginative and think bigger, taking advantage of the new five-year funding settlement. Uh, and we've opted for the latter course. And today uh, we bring a comprehensive deal, we bring it together, that's been jointly developed and agreed by GPC England, as well as by the government uh, for the board's ratification. It marks the first major step to implement the long-term plan, as well as dealing uh, with many of the big challenges currently facing general practice. 
Uh, we cover a lot of ground, and I'm just going to run through some of the highlights before I turn to Richard and then your questions. So, um, what does it include? Funding entitlements for 20,000 additional staff, just as the GP Charter in 1965 led to practice nurses becoming a core part of the general practice team, so now will pharmacists, paramedics, physios, social prescribers and physicians associates. 70% reimbursement, 100% for social prescribing link workers. No taper, unlike the current pharmacist scheme. Up to £891 million in dedicated new funding by 23-24. An extension of measures uh, to uh, recruit and retain more GPs and nurses. A new fellowship scheme covering both. An early and full response uh, to the recently published uh, partnership review covering five of their seven recommendations. We explicitly ask government for a partial pension scheme like the 50% scheme uh, that exists for local government. Recruitment and retention made easier because of the new NHS resolution indemnity scheme starting in April this year. It will be free at the point of membership. All practice staff and out of hours staff will be covered including sessional GPs and all the new workers I've already alluded to. And it's without a cut in income, as many had feared, but instead a 1.4% rise in core practice income in 2019-20. Major improvements to the quality and outcomes framework. 31% of the least effective indicators are being retired. New quality improvement modules to support professional development, starting with prescribing safety and end-of-life care, indicator reform, starting with diabetes and hypertension, and an overhaul of exception reporting. There'll be an entitlement to a network contract with 100% of England covered by the 1st of July this year, backed by cash and development support from CCGs and ICSs. Networks will become the basis for all NHS local care services. There will be uh, up to £1.799 billion that could flow through networks under this national deal by 23-24. Continued IT infrastructure support, new, new digital platform support to enable patients uh, to have the right to web and video consultations, there's recognition of the burden of subject access requests, data protection, officer support, fairer funding to avoid unwarranted redistribution given the emergence of digital first models, an out of area registration review, joining up the urgent care system outside hospital with networks taking on extended hours, 111 redirecting more people to pharmacists, we expect, than it will to practices to help alleviate demand. The extra capacity will help networks deliver improvements for their patients in a phased way, working with community health teams. This includes medication reviews, better support for care homes, implementing the Vanguard model, proactive care for people with complex needs, including people with multimorbidity, Supporting earlier cancer diagnosis, um, if you just think uh, the average uh, network of 50,000 people sees typically 270 to 280 new cancer diagnoses a year. The long-term plan goal is we move from roughly 50% diagnosis at stage one and stage two up to 75% by 2028. So for every network, that's an extra 70 or so people to be diagnosed at stage one and stage two. Uh, working closely with secondary care services and the development of the rapid diagnostic centres as well as the review of screening that Professor St Mike Richards is uh, uh, undertaking at the moment. Um, also earlier detection um, of uh, the many people uh, in England who have hypertension and atrial fibrillation um, who are currently undiagnosed as well as picking up on our last conversation 
uh, local action at the network level within neighbourhoods uh, to tackle health inequalities. Uh, it will also involve uh, implementation by networks of the NHS uh, comprehensive model of personalised care, which we turn to as our next agenda item. There will be uh, a new data service for networks to show how they're doing on prevention goals, on access, on proactive care and wider NHS use. A new £300 million fund by 23-24, an investment and impact fund to help secure faster progress on all of these long-term plan goals, including the redesign of outpatient care, um, and a programme of testing changes before they're introduced. Uh, this five-year deal provides funding certainty uh, for the first time covering five years in primary care history. Core practice income uh, will rise by £978 million by 2324. That's 12% in cash terms um, and an average anticipated 0.4% in real terms. Uh, with then the 1.799 billion uh, for primary care network funding on top of that. Uh, and there will also be a balancing mechanism to protect against either excessive uh, unanticipated inflation or um, uh, practice earnings. So before I hand over to Richard, um, I'd just like to say that the progress I think we've made over the last uh, month is down to the quality of the joint working between our teams, Richard. Um, and I'd like to pay tribute um, to your side, uh, to Farah, to Krishna and Mark, as well as yourself. Um, and then uh, my deputy chair, um, Ed Waller, who's uh, sitting in the audience there, um, who's done an absolutely outstanding job, as has his team, uh, Amanda um, Doyle, Cathy Winfield, two of our ICS leaders, um, Arbid Irfan, and uh, Nikki Kanani, who is also in the audience. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Ian. Um, it, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I think this is a really important moment for general practice. I think it's backed and was made possible by the commitment that NHS England made around the funding, um, which you've just been talking about, for general practice, primary care, um, and community care services. Uh, and I think it's fundamental that we shore up the foundation of the NHS because it, general practice is the bedrock on which the rest of the NHS is built. And we want a strong foundation so that the rest of the NHS can thrive and develop. And this has been a, uh, a long gestation. I think we've worked really hard sort of, you know, to get where we've got to. You can get a sense of how comprehensive the scale and scope is from what Ian has just outlined. Uh, but I think there are some fundamental things here uh, which I just wanted to, to highlight. Um, the first is that this will allow a workforce expansion. You'll have seen um, the headlines today around 20-odd thousand uh, multi-professionals working alongside and embedded with uh, GPs in their practices, uh, so it'll be pharmacists, social prescribers, um, physicians' associates, uh, physios, uh, and others working with GPs to provide better care to their patients. And recognising the fact, something which I have and my colleagues have articulated repeatedly over recent years, the workload pressures that GPs are under will in part be helped and supported by this expansion of the workforce team. I think that's fundamental to enable patients to get an appointment uh, with their GP and others within the team. Uh, and that's what we want to see change, um, is to help practices support their workload pressures and to do more in different ways uh, through the digital changes that will be taking place as well. So I think this is a fundamental change. I think something else to point out is that this builds on the existing GMS contract and the practice that has uh, stood the test of time uh, for many, many years. Um, Ian alludes to 1965, another landmark time, and there's been various times along a, uh, a long uh, journey for general practice, but I think this feels like uh, another watershed moment um, and provides us the opportunity, if implemented uh, well, sort of as we hope it will be, and we'll certainly be committed to do that, uh, to actually make a real change that not only delivers those 20,000 additional staff, but also provides a different environment within general practice that gives confidence to young doctors to become GPs um, and for older doctors to stay as GPs uh, so that we can actually expand the workforce as well because crucially we do need more GPs uh, alongside uh, these other healthcare professionals working alongside us to deliver what patients expect us to do. 
And I think thirdly, I think the real commitment to deliver on indemnity changes, uh, to actually move us to a situation that has long been the case in secondary care, uh, where doctors are not penalised for choosing general practice um, as a career choice and having to pay significantly um, um, inflated and, and rapidly increasing amounts of indemnity costs just to practice as a GP. That will be taken away by this change, and that will make a fundamental difference um, both for younger doctors and older doctors um, as they choose to be general practitioners in the future. So I think this is a, an important moment. Um, I want to pay tribute, I think, to, to Ian uh, and to his team, particularly to, to Ed, who's done a huge amount of work sort of, you know, in terms of getting us to this point, um, and to the teams sort of, that worked with you. Um, and you've already mentioned sort of, you know, my team as well, uh, who've worked with us sort of, diligently. Sort of, that's Mark and Farah and Krish, and the support teams sort of, within BMA who've made this possible. There is still a lot of work to do. We should not give the sense that the problems will be solved on the 1st of April uh, when this contract change starts to uh, be implemented. This is going to be a long journey. There will be bumps on the road. We want to work with you in a collaborative way, a way that we've been able to do over the last few months, to make this a reality and to make general practice and the rest of the NHS better as a result of doing so. Thank you both very much. Look, why don't we just ask you some questions if we can. I mean, if, if Ed and Nikki would like to say anything as well, I mean, come up and sit next to Richard there and you can give us your, your comments as well. We'd like <laughs> to hear them. But anyway, while we, while we wait for you to come forward, if you'd like to, um, don't feel you have to, but you may now feel <laughs> you have to. <laughs> you have to bring your own um, chair. <laughs> but let's open it up to questions, anyway, from the board. Who, who, would, like to, who would like to kick off? I think Ruth, you had. You, did you want to? You want to kick off? I should just say, this, Ruth, this is your first meeting, I think, at the board, isn't it? So I should have said that at the beginning. But welcome. Thank you. Um, a couple of things, and thank you both for that um, uh, presentation of this work. So thank you. Um, I'm delighted uh, this builds on the work that NHS England have been doing over a number of years to see the number of practice nurses uh, increase by over 600. So that's fantastic. It's good as well that we're recognising that there is a practice team. It's not just about doctors and nursing, and I think this nurses and I think this uh, particular work that you've all done takes us to the next level of uh, multi-professional teams coming together for um, patients, and uh, I think that's fantastic. Um, I, I'd be keen, uh, I guess, to work with you about how we really uh, celebrate the Primary Care Fellowship Programme for newly qualified uh, registered nurses and doctors and I'm just wondering how you think um, I can support in my new role as Chief Nursing Officer <coughs> how we uh, ensure that there are as many nurses going for that as doctors. Thank you. And Ruth, I really do recognise that. I think it's great that we're talking about the wider team now. And um, it's the only way we're going to work and keep yeah. general practice sustainable. Um, actually, your team's already been in touch. So oh, we've started brilliant. to do some work, understanding which fellowships, because there are some nursing fellowships that exist around the country, as you know. Um, so we're going to try and get the best out of those examples and build up our nursing fellowships to reflect that. Um, and then I'm coming back to you in a couple of weeks' time to present it back to you and see what you Fantastic. think. Fantastic. Super. Thank you very much. Look forward to supporting it personally. Um, let's go to Steve first, yes. and then Michelle. Steve. Uh, so um, I know how much hard work has gone into this, so again, my congratulations. I think it's a, a huge uh, step forward, and I think it will be seen as a, a landmark moment in terms of uh, support and development of primary care. So like Ruth, uh, I think it's fantastic that we are recognising, uh, again, the wider team in, uh, in primary care that supports general practice. It's there already, but this gives it another further push. Uh, and uh, like uh, David, I have visited many practices where I have a sense of seeing the future, where many of, much of this work is already uh, going on, uh, where pharmacists are being used uh, and others in really innovative ways. Uh, but I just wondered uh, whether Richard and Nicky, as sort of practicing GPs, could give a real sense as to what this means for a member of the public. So, Richard, you talked about being able to get more time with the GP, uh, but it's not just that. Uh, so I think it would be really useful for the board to hear uh, from the public and the citizen and patient perspective what this will mean. 
Hey, yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, as a GP in Leeds, I've um, had the fortune to have a CCG who supported some of these developments already. Um, and as a practice, we have employed a pharmacist in recent months who've made, who's made a tremendous difference to our practice, uh, not only sort of in reducing some of the workload burden for the individual GPs, but in medicine reconciliation, liaising sort of with uh, local community pharmacists um, and with uh, the hospitals sort of when patients have been discharged, but also liaising directly with individual patients, patients with complex problems, people who have been addicted to opioids and other uh, uh, medications sort of that they want help and support uh, to get off. Um, and with the pharmacist direct supervision, they've been able to do that in a way that's made a big difference to our patients. Similarly, we've had for the last um, a few months uh, physio first contact. So when a patient rings up with back pain or knee pain, uh, then they can be put in touch with a physio first of all, rather than necessarily having to see a GP and then be referred uh, to that physio to get further advice. Um, and over the winter, we've been fortunate to be working with a scheme around paramedics. Uh, so we've had paramedics doing home visits. Uh, and so where it's been appropriate, the patient has been triaged first by a GP uh, following a home visit request. Uh, the paramedic has been to do the visit and then reported back to the practice. So again, it just frees up time and it provides a sense of working as a comprehensive team. So we've seen the reality of what can happen, what we want to ensure is every practice has a pharmacist in place, every practice has the ability to work with a social prescriber uh, and others as well, because I think by doing so, it will start to magnify some of the benefits. Thank you. I mean, I can't add much more to that. I won't steal James's thunder for later, but um, I mean, I've talked about my social prescriber and how I have... Uh, I mean, one of my favourite uh, patients, I don't think you're supposed to say that, but one of my favourite patients who for years has really struggled with anxiety and, and being really lonely in her 80s has started tap dancing. And before Christmas, she came in to tell me that she'd fallen in love with someone at her tap dancing class. It has changed her life, and it means that it changes my life and the way that I practice as well. But patients will get a different kind of digital offer as well. So my kids want to access care and will want to access care in a completely different way from that lady will. Um, and, and this is the beginning of being able to do that properly. David. I think your question was asked. So, yeah. so, so Richard um, and Nikki and the team, um, I think it's great to hear from you the practical examples and there are clearly examples across the country where this is working. I guess my uh, question is I'm, I'm curious to know how do we implement this and how do we make sure that we don't have every practice repeating the learnings that you've already seen and heard. So the, the paper's reasonably silent on what happens next, and I'd be interested to know. Shall I, shall I just pick up first on that? So um, this builds on a, I think, a long tradition of collaborative provision. Uh, so just to pick another uh, date, uh, the 1995 um, out of hours development deal that was done uh, where actually general practice rose very rapidly uh, to the opportunity of the deal that the BMA did then uh, to construct co-ops um, and I think that's a really um, good precedent. Uh, we know from the work that Dominic Hardy and his team are doing that 88% of the of practices according to internal NHS England data as of end of September were already uh, forming primary care networks um, so this is not a journey that starts kind of de novo now. This has actually been a journey that people have been on for several years. Um, there's a lot of CCG support available. There has been both cash support and in kind. Um, we encourage both. Um, the cash support is important. Um, the £1.50 a head uh, plus also additional funding to support the clinical director. Um, I think by being really clear in a way that hasn't been true for GP federations up until now about the money over a five-year period, actually it will give people the confidence to be able to engage in this really fully. Um, additionally, we have a major new development program um, which Dom will be running around primary care network development. <coughs> that will be centrally funded and it is on top of the numbers we've alluded to in this particular deal. Notwithstanding that, it will clearly take some time before all networks are equally effective 
across the country and we are trying to recognize that um, with the phased introduction of some of the different services. Um, the strength of networks will partly depend on the uh, success they have in being able to recruit the different additional staff. Uh, but I think people can potentially see, um, you know, this is you know, maybe you know, somewhere between 16 and 20 whole time equivalents per network additionally coming in by 23, 24, and that will make a really major difference. I don't know if you want to add. Uh, well, I think the only thing to add is that the one thing that GPs are is world experts at responding quickly to change. Um, so if we've had you know, countless changes in recent years, um, you know, from out of hours to fund holding to practice space commissioning, uh, PCG and CCG uh, developments, um, and in every case, GPs have stepped up sort of and got on with it. I think the difference here is this is about provision. This is about providers working together. You know, and GPs are very much up for that. Sort of, they want to be able to uh, to rebuild the primary care team around their practices and within their localities. And I think that's something that's fundamental. Sort of, that will enable them to be leaders of a wider community team, uh, which will sort of reap dividends in all sorts of ways. I think alongside that, Richard, though, clearly there's also the digital dynamic as well, which would perhaps be slightly newer to federations. Yes, absolutely. And I think one of the fundamentals to that is ensuring that the building blocks are in place. So one of the key lines within this is ensuring uh, that you know, broadband capacity, uh, that the kit is in place, so that then people can use that as a springboard to make the rest of the system work. Um, you know, if you give kit to um, and systems in place that, that facilitates good care, GPs will want to use it as quickly as possible. But we need those fundamental sort of in place, and we know that CCGs are starting to roll that out now. Nikki. I just suggest um, to the board that in terms of implementation, one of the best things we can do is not to ruin it before it starts. So actually internally, we need to make sure that we join the dots on primary care, make sure we know where we're trying to get to, and then let the networks get on. Um, this is building on the social movement. People are doing this anyway because they know it's the right thing to do. They want to do it for their patients and their population. They are absolutely addressing the health inequalities that we talked about that Simon referred to. So we need to let that happen and then step in, escalate and solve when it's appropriate for us to do so. I guess the last thing I would say uh, is probably that there is already some learning on some aspects of this from things like the existing clinical pharmacist scheme. So some of that will be uh, fed through into the, the future and explicitly we describe ways in which we will go about testing some of the things that we want to do through the contract over the next five years and having a five-year contract gives us the opportunity to do that in a way we haven't been able to because we can see what comes further down the track and we can make sure by the time we get there we've collectively tested how best to do some of these things. Nikki, if you had 10 F2 doctors sitting in front of you, yes. think, and they were thinking, should we go to general practice or go into acute medicine? Mm -hmm. What would you say, how would you, what, what would you, how, what, what would be your sales pitch to them? It's yeah. funny, I, I, I've been doing this quite a lot recently, you wouldn't be surprised to hear. Um, do you know, when I ask people if they want to go into general practice, very few hands um, are, are, are put up. I've had over 100 messages this morning from people in the profession, that's trainees, that's medical students, that's nurses, that's clinical pharmacists, saying this is the moment, this is absolutely the moment where we can see that this is going to be different. We're going to look after you, we're going to value you, we're going to respect you, and we're going to make primary care absolutely take the role that it should do within the wider system to make the whole system work. So they will be engaged and they'll want to be part of this. Uh, no, I mean, I would echo that. I mean, as I said earlier, I think this does provide a, a real confidence boost to the profession as a whole. We clearly need to see it implemented, and there will be lots of cynics around. They've seen false dawns before. But I think there is a significant investment here. There's a real commitment around the workforce, you know, and I think that will start to make a difference. But, you know, as Nikki said, we need to be really careful uh, not to sort of, you know, to overplay things. We need to sort of be measured in our approach, uh, but certainly GPs are, want to uh, provide better care to their patients with the right support, and we're up for that. Perhaps we could just um, conclude by asking you, Simon, just to sort of set this in the context of the long-term plan and how it sits within that. Well, the long-term plan really has two big thrusts, doesn't it? One is changing the way services uh, work together for patients, and the other is using that to drive big improvements in clinical outcomes for cancer and heart disease and mental health and the other big killers and disablers of the population. And the foundation of both of those is primary care. 
because we have 300 million patient visits a year to GP practices, uh, you know, compared, say, with 15 million visits to hospital A&E departments. So, as Richard said, primary care is absolutely essential. It's been under real stress as a result of uh, funding pressures versus workload uh, increases. Uh, we've had, as a result, uh, retirements, uh, but the flip side is we've seen an increasing number of young doctors choosing general practice as a career. So what this, I think, means is that we've got the uh, primary care and the community health services in a given uh, geography in towns and cities and villages working closely together now, because we haven't talked so much about that, but it's actually the primary care network that's bringing the community health nurses uh, as well as the uh, primary care teams together for their local people. And frankly, most people would expect the health service to be operating in this joined up way anyway. As we all know, the history is it hasn't been. And by making a start with the backing for the staff and the new ways of working and the new offer for the public, I think people will on a phased basis, as Richard says, begin to really see the difference. Excellent. Well, thank you. I think we're all in violent agreement. It's a, it's a, fan, it's a great bit of work, Ian. So it's thanks to you and all your team. Formally ratify the agreement? Yeah. I just want to tell everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Nick has already tweeted it's, that I out did already. like to. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, no, thank you very much. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. So moving on to the next item, which is very closely related on um, personalised care. Ian, it's over to you again. Thank you very much, David. Um, and can I welcome uh, James Sanderson, who is the director of the Personalised Care Group, and Robin, um, who uh, works very closely uh, with James um, uh, as one of the members of our co-production team. Um, so from... Uh, the one part of chapter one of the long-term plan uh, to another part. Um, uh, this item is uh, about how we're now going to implement the long-term plan's commitments on personalised care. Uh, we set out some big goals here. Uh, two and a half million people uh, benefiting by 2023-24. Uh, we've said a thousand uh, extra social prescribers in primary care networks by 2021. In practice, as we've just heard, there will be thousands of extra social prescribing link workers um, funded 100% as part of the 20,000 additional staff. Um, these will support an estimated uh, minimum of 900,000 people benefiting from social prescribing by 2024. Uh, 200,000 people benefiting from personal health budgets, and we'll hear from Robin shortly about her own particular story. Uh, I think this is the most ambitious set of commitments around personalised approaches to care made anywhere in a healthcare system. And um, I think it will have a profound effect not just in the next five years, but actually over the next 20 years. Um, what James has done, I think, um, apart from fermenting a social movement, um, is actually creating the rigour and structure to be able to implement this at scale. Um, and he will now uh, run through the detail of our plan. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's great to be here today to present um, Universal Personalised Care. Um, but just to start off in terms of what we mean by personalised care, we mean that um, we're going to increase the number of people that will have choice and control over the way in which their care is planned and delivered around what matters to them and building on their individual strengths um, and needs. Um, so it's about a shift in focus um, from what's wrong with you to what matters to you and looking at an aim to change the way in which people both interact with their own health and care and also the way in which they interact with the system that's delivering that care to them. And we aim to do this through the delivery of our comprehensive model for personalised care. The important thing about the comprehensive model is that it builds on a significant amount of work that's taken place across the country over many years. Um, but what it does is it brings together what currently is quite a fragmented approach and puts six evidence-based um, enablers together in one model. Um, so just to set out those six um, items, 
Um, we start with shared decision making. We want to increase the opportunity for people to have shared conversations um, between themselves and healthcare professionals, looking at making decisions based on the evidence and impact of the particular decisions that are available to them. We then want to make good on our commitments to give people choice and control over the pathways um, that are available. Going beyond that, for people with multiple mobility and complex needs, we want to make sure that increasingly people have an holistic, personalised care and support plan. The opportunity for them to document a care plan that is meaningful to them and supports them. And we're increasingly looking to support people who are living with cancer, people with dementia and people at the end of life care with a really comprehensive plan for how they're going to be supported in the system. Beyond that, we want to look at new ways of supporting people. And firstly, as we've heard earlier and um, through social prescribing, linking people to community-based interventions. And the um, opportunity to increase the number of link workers is a really significant one. We're building on some great work that's happening at the moment um, across the country. We've got voluntary sector partners, local government and the NHS working together with people and communities to build active communities around social prescribing and create opportunities for people. This is an additional workforce. It's not to step on the toes or replicate or replace um, anybody else that's working in the system. And link workers will work very closely with other professionals such as social workers and, and occupational therapists to support people in the community. We also want to increase the skills, knowledge and confidence of individuals to give people the opportunity to um, take a better and more active role in their health and care. We know that some people would like to take more responsibility for their health, but don't have the means to do so. So actually, we can support tackling health inequality by increasing that capability that people have to self-manage. And we want to increase the opportunity for health coaching, the opportunity for patient activation to improve that, that position for people. We also want to increase uh, personal health budgets. We know that when delivered well, personal health budgets can increase the opportunity for people to achieve their outcomes for independent living um, and for their health and well-being. We know that 86% of people who receive a personal health budget are satisfied that it meets their needs. And we've also got growing evidence of the impact on the system as well, with a 17% cost saving against the cost of delivering continuing healthcare funding by giving people that choice and control. The important thing about universal personalised care is that it has been co-produced over about three years now. We've worked extensively with communities, with people with lived experience, right from the beginning of this process. And the um, rollout um, of the programme means that we can continue to spread that best practice that's grown up in individual areas across the rest of the country. And what the document does, it brings together really clear operating models for each of these components. It's not just um, a, a number of warm words related to personalised care. It is an active delivery plan that will actually make this happen across the country and reach that 2.5 million people. I'm really pleased uh, today to have Robin, um, who's going to share her reflections on why personalised care is important. Robin's a member of our strategic co-production group and sits on our advisory board for personalised care and has played an instrumental role, along with many others across the country, in developing the plans that we've got today. Thank you, James. Thank you, Chair. Um, so my name's Robin Chappell. Um, I've been a personal health budget holder for about three years. Uh, I had a spinal cord injury in 2006, and I needed 24-hour um, care and support ever since. Before I had my PHB, my care was in the hands of an agency who provided PAs who would come and live with me for anywhere between 24 hours and three weeks at a time. I had no say in who the agency was sent to me, and they had a very high turnover of staff, which meant that I had no continuity of care and a constant procession of strangers through my front door. Um, I lived at the mercy of whoever the agency sent to me, and because they were often short-staffed, I often had PAs who were completely unsuitable. I never knew um, whether I would have a PA in place who would be capable of getting me out of bed safely, never mind anything else that I might have wanted to do with my day, so I wasn't able to make commitments. My PHB has enabled me to take control of my care and it has given me my life back. I use my PHB to employ my MPAs directly. I now employ two full-time PAs and my current PAs have been with me for 18 months and two years. I've gone from having 36 different PAs in 2014, which was my last full year with the agency, to having five PAs providing my care in 2018. Having the right support in place that suits me and my needs and having the choice and control in how that care and support is provided has meant that I've been able to return to work, which just wasn't possible before. 
I'm back to having an active social life and my health has improved because my PAs know me, they know my needs and they are able to provide proactive preventative care. I now hold a role as a member of the Personalised Care Strategic Co-Production Group um, which means that I'm able to use my experience, my knowledge and skills to provide invaluable and experiential learning that balances system level priorities with what matters most to people. Um, we work to ensure that what is offered through the programme is clear, empowering, outcomes focused and that it makes sense to people. We um, particularly welcome the plans to recruit 500, peer, 500 new peer leaders, as James was saying, to scale the work that we're already doing along the co-production. As members of the Strategic Co-Production Group, we hold roles on the Personalised Care Advisory Board to inform and influence policy and strategy. And we've been involved in the development of universal personalised care from the outset, ensuring that the voices and insight of people who have experienced a personalised approach firsthand are woven through the delivery plan from start to finish. So we're really excited to share in today's plans and the commitment to see many more people benefit from personalised care. Thank you, Robin. Um, and um, uh, just to um, announce today um, our latest figures in relation to personal health budgets, um, so increasing the opportunity um, that um, uh, Robin's had for, for many more people. We, we now have 40,344 uh, people who are receiving a personal health budget, which is our quarter three um, figure, um, which means that we've um, already achieved our target of 40,000 personal health budgets that we established for um, this year. Um, it's a big increase in the last few years, uh, over 300% increase and we're seeing um, considerable benefits to people across um, the country through personal health budgets. The, just to finish off in relation to the plan, um, the really um, uh, important thing about the plan is that it's got widespread, widespread support. We've worked with over 50 organisations um, who are supporting um, the plans that we've got here today. Um, we've got a significant programme of activity with 21 actions in the plan that we want to take forward. Um, that includes a significant programme of training um, and focus on supporting the front line, including supporting the development of primary care networks that we've um, just heard about um, at the meeting. So really pleased to present the paper to the board today and welcome any questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, James. And Robin, thank you especially thank you. for coming today. It sort of brings it alive to everybody, I think, just how important it is that, and the impact it can have and getting your life back together again, absolutely. really. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So thank you, thank you especially. Thank you Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Michelle. Uh, thank, thank you, Robin, and thank you, James. Um, I think it was maybe 18 months, two years ago, when you first came to Commissioning Committee and then to the board with some of your uh, original reflections and thinking on this area. And to many of us, it makes absolute sense, this change. But I think one of the challenges was how do we move it from uh, a range of local initiatives or initiatives across parts of the country into an evidence-based model of change? And I think this absolutely does that. So I want to congratulate you not only on your leadership, but on the speed in which you have taken forward the learning from many different sectors, built a collaboration, a coalition of support of over 50 organisations uh, and charities and community groups, but also clearly citizens who this makes a huge difference to. Um, it's a great, great piece of work, James, really. A um, couple of points and reflections from me, if you could, if you could touch upon this, this would be great. Um, firstly, the voluntary sector has been very involved for 20, 30 years in, in what we now call social prescribing and personalised care. How will the NHS work with the voluntary sector to ensure that we're partners in the delivery of this really exciting programme? And secondly, I think the personalised care has a huge, huge opportunity to help reduce inequalities. And I'd really like you to expand a bit further on how this programme of work can really reach people who we most need to reach. Um, thank you very much, uh, Michelle, and um, thank you very much for um, you, you, your very warm comments. But of course, um, you know, th this, this has been about a huge partnership, mm -hmm. and I'm really grateful to the support of my team, in particular Nicola Kay and Rich Watts, who've, uh, who've put a huge effort into creating the report, but also the partners that we've worked with, because there's been input from a huge mm -hmm. range, uh, array of people um, over the past couple of years. Um, in terms of um, the voluntary sector, um, clearly the voluntary sector plays a really significant role in the delivery 
um, of this plan. And we are extending our commitment in the document to, to work um, extensively with the voluntary sector around how we take the next stage forward. The plan very much builds on the work of um, programmes like Realising the Value and the VCSE Review and builds on work that the Health and Wellbeing Alliance have done and work of organisations such as National Voices, Think Local Act Personal and the Coalition for Collaborative Care as well. So our commitment to continue to work with those organisations to find the best way in which the voluntary sector can engage in this is incredibly important. I think the key thing is that we now have developed an infrastructure for how this can operate. And I mentioned before about how fragmented the system had been, and I think a lot of the relationships and a lot of the um, provision that's in place was fairly fragile. What we'll do with this um, structure is give local systems the permission to engage in a different way with the voluntary sector. And we're confident that that's um, going to uh, produce some really interesting results because in the areas that we've been piloting this across the country, and about a third of the country now that's engaged in this, we've seen some excellent collaborations between health and social care and the voluntary sector to create opportunities for co-commissioning services and opportunities um, to work together. And we've got a specific action to work with other government departments, with voluntary sector providers, um, including uh, people like the Big Lottery Fund mm -hmm. and also other arm's length bodies, including per um, Public Health England, um, to look at ways that we can make that funding for the voluntary sector sustainable to support this. Just in terms of health inequalities in particular, um, if you take something like patient activation measurement, a um, recent Health Foundation report found that those with the lowest skills, confidence and knowledge who were um, uh, registering as what's called PAM Level 1, patient activation measurement level 1, um, were likely to um, face the highest level of inequality. And if you work with them to increase their skills and knowledge, and you're actually shifting them from, from level one to level four mm -hmm. with the highest level of skills, knowledge and confidence, you could reduce GP attendance by 19% and hospital admissions by 38%. So I think there's some really strong evidence now, mm -hmm. as you said, that working with people in this personalised way can actively tap into the assets that they bring to their own care, look at building the support that exists within the community around them, and actually enabling them to um, have the choice and control that they want over the care uh, that they perhaps do not have at the moment. Okay, thank you, James. Yeah, okay. I would uh, I'd just um, reiterate how that this is all, all excellent, it's very comprehensive, it's very clear. But I've got a, a sort of general question on this, which is, Personalised care is not just equivalent to personal budgets. And I guess the question for, for the three of you is, is Robin got real benefit from having a personal health budget? How do we ensure that the people that don't want to have personal health budgets get exactly what Robin can get without that, that financial element? And that's a bit I still sort of struggle with a bit because... If I listen to you, Robin, yeah. I sort of sit there and think, actually, you should have been able to get that stuff without having a personal health budget. So what is there in the way we do this that, that helps deliver that for people who don't want the personal health budgets? Um, so um, just in terms of um, the, the programme, um, as you quite rightly say, mm. Richard, the personal health budgets um, are not going to work for everybody. No. And within the figures that we're setting out, um, our intention to support 2.5 million people over the next five years and we anticipate that mm -hmm. 200,000 people will have a personal health budget. Yeah. So it, it shows that the significant Absolutely. majority of people will experience other parts of the model, whether yeah. that's social prescribing, support through shared yeah. decision making, having a much more active care plan. And, and actually using the model to engage mm. with people opens up those opportunities to develop some packages of support mm. in a way that matters to them without the need for a personal health budget. Yeah. But in certain areas of the system, we're finding a huge opportunity to give people that additional control. So if you look at something like wheelchair services, for example, um, an example recently um, of a young man called um, Dylan who wanted um, a different wheelchair that was, that was higher than the um, cost of the wheelchairs that were being provided in the area. Um, he's a gentleman with cerebral palsy, needed electronic foot plates mm -hmm. in order to be able to get in and out of his wheelchair on his own. And whilst um, uh, he could access certain... Um, features um, within the system. Having a personal health budget enabled him to combine mm. money from the NHS with money from adult social care, 
And through that integrated budget, he was able to buy a, buy a higher specification wheelchair that, that has given him the independence to go to university without the need of a carer. And it's actually cost, um, you know, I think £2,000 extra for his wheelchair and at the same time um, saved £13,000 in, in care costs. So trying to get that shift where it matters is important. But I take your point. I mean, it's not going to be the right model for, for everybody. Robin, if you want to comment. Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> Um, I think uh, in regards to personal health budgets, um, not everybody will want to have a direct payment option. Yeah. Um, so there's three different ways of managing them. So you can have a notional budget, um, a third party budget, um, or a direct payment option. So that if you don't want to have the, the financial responsibility of having a direct payment as I do, then there's that option. Um, but as James was saying, the whole um, the whole context of personalised care is about opening up a different conversation and being able to work in partnership with health professionals um, so that instead of being dictated to and being told how your health condition can rule your life, you can work with your health professionals um, to work around your health condition and, and, and really get to grips with what matters to people. Thank you. Uh, so, um Thank you, James and Robin, and thank you, James, again, for all the hard work. It's a fantastic uh, programme. And thank you, Robin, for so wonderfully describing uh, what it actually means uh, to you as an individual. And, and actually, I just wanted to follow on from the comment you just made about, about the professionals who you work with. And I think James touched on this a little bit. So, so as this programme expands, it will mean changes for the way our frontline staff work. Uh, and I just wondered if you could expand a little bit and give us a sense of what those changes will be and how we support our staff in making the changes. Um, so um, the really positive thing is that uh, we have um, thousands of staff across the country that are, all de that are already delivering excellent personalised um, care um, in terms of um, you know, our, G our GP profession and, and, and many nurses and other healthcare professionals that we have in the system. Uh, we recognise, though, that training is going to be a significant requirement um, of this, and we're committing to train at least 75,000 people over the next few years to equip them with the skills of, of how to have that different conversation, so how to have the shared decision-making conversation in 30 clinical pathways, for example. We're working on specific tools um, uh, across um, lots of clinical areas. Um, we're also working with um, the Royal College of GPs, the Royal College of Nurses, Royal College of OTs. We intend to work with them to look at how we can embed personalised care training within curriculums um, right at the beginning. Um, and we've got some fantastic support from, um, from colleagues across the system in, in order to do that. But we recognise there's also a cultural shift that, re that, that needs to happen here as well. Um, so continuing to work um, with our partners in local communities. And I think it, it's a really important role that Robin and her colleagues as peer leaders play in actually talking to people about the difference this has made to their lives and starting to shift that focus of how things can be different. If, if we just change the way in which we approach things. Um, but the package of support that we're putting in place within universal personalised care really concentrates on equipping the workforce with the skills that they need to deliver this. just to see how it's had um, great impact on your health but as well it's opened doors again for your social life and indeed getting back into work and I guess that's what struck me in your, your example as well as Robin's example is how this is really tackling health inequalities it's putting policy into actual practice so that's just fantastic your last point then was about um, how you're um, getting the training for is it 60,000 people 75,000 we're 000, aiming for. Okay, um, even better. <laughs> um, fantastic. Um, I'd like to offer my personal support in coming into this new role about how we support the whole care profession, not just nurses in this, but the whole care profession, about how we can do that. Very happy to work with you in that. And well done again. It's been uh, fantastic to listen to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you both, all, all of you very much. It's fantastic. Thank it's you, Chair. Another, Thank you, very much. you know, it just fits so well with the whole GP work of GPs as well. It's just part of a package, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So it's fantastic, and uh, it's going to change the lives of tens of thousands of people. So thank you. Hundreds of thousands of people, actually. Yeah. 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 So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. We'll go on to operational performance. Um, Matthew, do you want to um, kick off on our on performance uh, and, bring in, and bring in Pauline when you get to the winter? So I think we'll probably start off with the uh, 
A and E and winter yeah, pieces, Pauline, and then you hand back to me, if that's all right. Okay, so I'm going to report on urgent and emergency care and then say a little bit about elective. Um, in reporting back on urgent and emergency care, I think it's probably important to remind the board of the conversations that we've been having over the course of the last 18 months or so about our reform agenda, um, the agenda that very much um, highlights the fact that we are leading a major transformation program, um, which will mean for our population that when they need urgent or emergency care, or when they perceive they need urgent and emergency care, that instead of um, attending the A&E department in the same way as somebody would have done in 1948, that instead they pick up the phone and they dial 111 and then we are able to direct you to the service that best meets your needs. Um, I wanted to mention that because I think when we look at our performance um, for December and year to date, um, it further gives us evidence that that reform agenda is successful and that it was the right thing to do. So when we look at attendances, yes, we have seen a growth in attendances year to date, but when we look at the type of attendances, they are to type three departments and type three services, so away from the core emergency um, department. Likewise, when we look at admissions, we've seen an, in, some increase in admissions, but mainly an increase in same-day emergency care, which again is a very different way of meeting the urgent or emergency um, care need that the patient perceives that they have. And we've seen that performance continue during the month of December. Our headline performance um, from a metric point of view um, was better than the previous December, um, up by about 1.2%. But I think most importantly to recognise the fact that within four hours we saw 3.9% more people than we had the previous December, so the year-on-year -year performance. So thanks to the amazing work of our staff throughout um, the urgent and emergency care pathway, from out of hospital, in hospital, etc., um, more people are being seen um, in a timely manner. And that also follows through for our ambulance service. Whilst activity was slightly increased during December, um, our ambulance staff working very closely with um, our hospital staff have managed to significantly reduce the number of handover delays. For 30 minutes, uh, the 30 minute metric, we've seen a decrease of 25%, and for the 60 minute metric, a decrease of 40% which I think is quite phenomenal and again is testament to the work that people are doing um, in hospital and in the ambulance service but I would stress most of all the fact that they are working together on a day-to-day -day basis to deliver this. Um, on our overall ambulance um, standards which we introduced last year as part of the reform agenda again we've seen an ongoing improvement in performance for all of those standards and for our CAT one performance and um, we record in the paper a performance of seven minutes six seconds uh, of a response time and that was an increase of about one minute 40 and uh, sorry an improvement of about one minute 46 seconds on the previous winter and um, when we look at our 111 service and um, our year to date um, activity is significantly increased um, about 800,000 um, more calls um, and really importantly our call answering times for December our 62nd metric um, up by about 10% year on year and most importantly the number of people receiving clinical advice through 111 up to 53% from 46% um, last year um, also 111 online being rolled out across England and by December reaching about 91.5% of areas. Um, when we look at our overall um, work um, on our discharge and length of stay, um, again we see an improvement. Um, if we look at the patients who've been with us for or in our acute hospitals for more than 21 days, we see a decrease of 1,739 
from when the baseline was established last spring, an ongoing improvement in DTOC. And I think some of that is definitely um, uh, contributed to the fact, or is influenced sorry, by the fact that um, we had the allocation of social care monies, the 240 million. And I think all reports back from throughout the service is that we've had very good system working um, between our health service staff, our local authority staff, our social care staff, etc. In preparation for this winter, but in delivery of care. Um, our overall winter arrangements have been put in place in a similar fashion to last year, and that's important because throughout the winter period we clearly do face challenges. We have a small number of organisations that we are providing intensive support to, and clearly we have got um, challenging times ahead of us as well as. Um, um, over the last couple of weeks um, around flu and um, with respect to weather. Just to say a little bit more on flu, um, the first comment is that the vaccine that we're using, we've seen a very good match with the um, virus, that uh, the uh, dominant virus, which has been H1N1. And that has meant that as far as our ability as a service to manage flu, um, the issues have been predominantly around HDUITU. H1N1 um, usually impacts adult patients, and when they're poorly, they tend to need high dependency care. So when we look across our hospital sector, our HDU and ITU beds um, during December were at about the same level um, from a flu perspective as the previous December. But in our general adult beds, we saw very few patients. From a vaccine or a vaccination perspective, um, the numbers are broadly in line with last year for the public um, and for our staff vaccination programme, we've seen a higher response um, than the previous year. So that's my update really on urgent and emergency care. I'll just move very quickly to RTT. Um, and again, I think it's worth while setting it in the context of an overall reform programme. Um, we have seen on our um, headline metrics um, our waiting list continuing to decrease. Um, we have seen real progress as far as long waits are concerned, and that's patients who are waiting more than 52 weeks. Um, if we look at performance over a five-month period, um, the numbers were down by just over 1,000. At the same time, CCGs um, are managing demand um, in line with the priorities that we set in the reform program. And if we look at GP referrals over a period of, say, uh, 15, 16 to 17, 18, we see that significant drop from 4.7% down to 1.8% of growth in referrals. And really, at the moment, we are just about flatlined. Um, and at the same time, a lot of work taking place in the development of alternative services to support that, for example, our MSK triage services, and overall work across 12 transformation areas and the production of handbooks that support the service. So that's my high-level report. I'll move on to Matthew, do you want to finish yeah. off on operations? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pauline. That, that, that's brilliant. And I think that that theme of the changes that we're, that we're bringing in in terms of the way the service is delivered both cross emergency and elective care dovetails very neatly into the conversation we had about the new GP contract and where it, it, Ian was taking us this uh, coming coming together and the um, uh, the musculoskeletal triage service covering 98% or, or, or of the country now uh, meaning that uh, people can contact that and be referred directly to a physiotherapist rather than being referred into um, an orthopedic outpatient as happened to me so, uh, so, so it's a real service. Um, the uh, in in other areas, um, I probably should follow through that. Just talk a bit about uh, where we are with, with digital services. Um, uh, the, NH uh, the NHS website, which uh, we've talked before about having moved to uh, uh, upgraded for NHS UK um, in December 2018. Um, 
it, it saw 10% more, 4 million more visits uh, than it had seen in December the year before. And the December the year before had been when we were just running into the flu uh, outbreak and it had been very high numbers then. We'd seen the highest ever numbers then as well. So we see a continued growth. So 40 million visits a month now on the NHS website. Um, and we've now got 80 apps live uh, on the app library with another 117 under, uh, uh, being reviewed for, for launch into the app library. So that's built, built up uh, speed. But, but the, I think the big news was, was the um, 31st of December, we, we launched the NHS app. Um, and uh, we're in the process now of working through with GP practices, connecting the, the app to every, to every practice. Because the, at the moment, anybody, I think, can, can download through their... Uh, through the Apple or uh, Google websites, the app. If your GP isn't yet connected, you'll have access to uh, NHS.UK information and you have access to 111 through it. Um, as your GPs are connected, you'll also have access to booking and accessing your GP record and, and, and so on. So uh, that, I think that's big pro progress. And over the next year, I would expect that to roll out to, be, uh, to offer the full services to, uh, to, 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 to all patients ac across the country. Um, in, in other areas, around, to talk about cancer, because we've discussed that a, a, a lot at the board, um, we are uh, we're seeing some improvement in, uh, in in our cancer performance, but we are still missing the, na the national uh, cancer standard for 62-day performance. Um, we're now achieving it. We're back achieving it in breast and skin cancers, but we have other uh, other cancer types. We're not making it, um, although say we're seeing some improvement. Um, we've seen. Uh, in the past year, a 10% increase in the number of patients being tr treated in the 62-day cancer pathway. So what we're seeing is, um, appropriately, a, a significant increase in the number of uh, potential cancers referred into the NHS, a significant increase in the number of diagnoses uh, that we're producing, a significant increase in the number of people who are being reassured they don't have cancer, and a significant increase in the number of people who are identifying with cancer that we can start trans uh, 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 care for uh, more quickly. Uh, we are, um, at the moment, we're, uh, across the country, gearing up our services to try, to try and respond to that increase in demand. And so it's very much going on at the moment and part of the planning for next year. So uh, we're not complacent about that at the moment. But uh, as part of the long-term uh, plan strategy is to identify more cancers earlier, this is something that needs to be a key part of our strategic direction, which is we need to build up our diagnostic and treat treatment capacity uh, in cancer. In primary care, um, we've now got 100% coverage of extended access um, uh, across the country. Um, whilst uh, we, this plays very much into the conversations and, and, and the agreement but, uh, that, that, that Ian's team have now settled uh, of um, driving forward um, the, the, uh, the workforce across primary care, um, we've exceeded the wider workforce target um, with 5,321 uh, additional staff recruited to date, including pharmacists and paramedics. Um, we are m still missing the numbers of uh, additional GPs, we are com and we're working very hard to try and make those numbers. Um, we've got 3,473 more doctors accepted onto specialty training, which is higher than the Health Education England target was, and 10% more than last year. So there is um, some good news there. In mental health, we are now for the first time uh, have 100% uh, of uh, CCGs on track to meet the mental health investment standard. Um, 4,450 additional women accessed perinatal mental health services during uh, the first half of uh, this financial year in the previous year, and we're on track to hit the access standards for children and young people's uh, mental health access as well. So I think we're seeing progress uh, uh, across the board, but uh, still a lot, of work to, uh, a lot of work to do in order to make sure that we land uh, uh, the, uh, the five-year forward view in, in advance of run, as we run into the long-term plan. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Pauline. Questions from Pauline? Yeah, Joanne. Um, thanks so much for that. I just wanted to pick up, um, Pauline, your, your sort of theme about um, creating a better range of choices for people if they, if they have an urgent care need and how that's coming on. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about um, the impact that NHS 111 online is starting to have. I noticed you had a figure of 100,000 in the paper, which seemed like a nice big number. Um, how, 
how are patients using it and do you have a feel yet for what contribution it, it's making or could make um, to the pressures in the future? Okay, so I, I think the thing to say at this point is that a lot of the feedback we're getting is anecdotal, uh, but we are searching for that feedback. And I think as with how society has changed, um, some of the feedback has been very positive because people have felt that asking them to pick up a phone and contact um, 111 um, at a time of need um, in a way that they would not do the rest of their business was somewhat out of date and that they felt that being able to do it online was maybe slightly less threatening but they also felt that the response time would be even quicker than it would be by phone. Now, whether that's a reality or not, from because we are driving up the response times as far as our call answering is concerned, but I think it's the public perception and that in all walks of life, we are behaving differently. And um, so all of the feedback that we have received to date, anecdotal as it is, is very positive. Um, you don't do the finance, Matthew, or you should go to this, Matt, just on, on the operational update. This, do you just want to update the board where we are on finance as well? I can do so well. briefly, yes. It's mm. at the back end uh, of the paper. Um, so uh, the, the, numbers, the numbers in the paper reflect the uh, forecast at month eight. Uh, the forecast currently has us uh, over-delivering on our planned underspend of 265 uh, million for the, for the full year, by a further 188 million, taking us to a 400 million. Uh, planned underspend for the year as a whole, um, uh, as 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 has been familiar from previous years. Within that, the pattern is of pressures emerging in some of the CCG forecasts, particularly around overperformance uh, on some contract on some contracts, uh, offset by uh, carefully managed underspends in some central budgets and uh, underperformance against the quality premium. Uh, we'll continue to keep the forecast under review, uh, in particular uh, through a series of deep dives off the back of the month nine forecast to ensure that the commissioning system can play its appropriate part in delivering financial balance across the NHS as a whole. Any, Matthew? That's good. Um, so before we move on to I wonder if you would me just to speak for a, talk for a moment about EU exit, if that was. Oh, Brexit. Yes. Yeah, just, just any, just, oh, absolutely, yeah. Any, any, just any questions on the performance anyone wanted to raise or on the money before we move on to Brexit? No, okay, over to you, Matthew, on Brexit. Thank you, yeah. Um, I mean, obviously our performance reports look backwards over our shoulder. We also have to be looking forwards to what may or may not happen at, at, at the end of March. And I think um, probably just worth saying um, that uh, there's a huge amount of work going on across the NHS at the moment to prepare for the potential of um, us exiting the European Union um, uh, uh, without a deal at, uh, at, at the end of March. Um, so uh, my team, um, we have set up a central team. We have created a series of regional teams, as Simon mentioned at the beginning. We now have uh, over 100. We have nearly 200 people now embed embedded in regional and national teams. Um, to, to coordinate um, and prepare for, if, if that is our eventuality. Um, we're working uh, with the Department of Health and Social Care or, who are leading on the critical uh, factor for us, which is the continued supply of medicines, medical equipment, and non-medical uh, uh, consumable goods, and Department of Health uh, Health and Social Care working very closely with the Department uh, for Transport to ensure that there are appropriate sea routes to bring in uh, the very large volumes of uh, uh, that the, the NHS requires to, to function normally. Um, and we are uh, putting in place plans to say, if we uh, if we uh, if they do what they need to do, then the NHS is geared up to handle the uh, uh, the flows that that happen at, that happen out of that. Um, we are. We, we've been doing a lot of communication with the NHS, and over the next three weeks, we will be um, conducting a, 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 a rolling tour around the country, talking to uh, the NHS provide, uh, providers and also um, the, the professional bodies to make sure that they know what we know and that all of our plans are in place, and that everybody is geared up to deal with um, the potential uh, impact of, of those changes. On Brexit, from anybody. I think we've had a pretty thorough discussion of this anyway, haven't we? So, it's, no. 
Um, moving on to the um, sort of governance part of the agenda, we've got um, four reports from <coughs> board committees. I think are really for noting. Does anyone who wants to raise anything? There is one we need to ratify a decision on. Please. I just, um, perhaps in the commissioning yeah. committee, I could just formally note for the board um, on both meetings. One is application of directions from the 28th of November meeting on uh, NHS Crawley, NHS Horsham and uh, Mid-Sussex CCG, and NHS East Surrey CCG, which the committee uh, noted and, and agreed in that meeting. And then we met again on the 12th of December, and in that meeting, um, there we reviewed the detail of a number of delegations of responsibilities uh, and agreed them for the following CCGs, NHS Dury, Surrey Downs, um, Morecambe Bay, Southport and Formby, South Selton, Bedfordshire, North Lincolnshire, East Surrey, Somerset, um, and Devon, um, as well as we approved the merger of the South Devon and Torbay CCG um, and the Northeastern and West Devon CCG. Do we need to ratify that paper, don't we? Yeah. yeah. Can, can, we can the board ratify that paper? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, then there's a note on the litigation update, and Catherine Iverson is here if we've got any detailed questions on, on that. But I think it's just for, for noting, I think, isn't it? Yeah. So, Catherine, I hope you didn't come all the way just to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> something else. Um, As we know, lawyers are paid by the hour, except for our <laughs> in-house legal team. <laughs> Fortunately, we don't have uh, that. Uh, we have huge confidence That's in their, their success yeah. as represented in this, uh, this paper. But, uh, yeah, the clock is not running. <laughs> and is there any other business? No. Yeah. Well, good. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I know the members of the public are not supposed to speak. I've been a nurse for 40 years on the front line, and I'm 70 years old, and I'm still working part-time. And I've never seen the NHS in such a bad state as it is now. And it upsets me a lot, because I see the 10-year plan and all the plans, not the implementation of the plans, but the plans. And you've only talked about the good aspects of them. It's been very self-congratulatory. There are lots of things to criticise about it, and I'm not going to go into that now, but the one thing I do want to say, which I have not heard in this meeting, is any real concern about the workforce that is going to do all this wonderful work. We haven't got enough staff now. We haven't had enough budget since 2010 to train staff. We haven't got any workforce strategy. An interim one coming in for spring and a further one in autumn. We need something now, we need people now, and it's going to take years before those people are in post. And I'm sorry, I just feel I have mm. to say that because I feel really strongly about it. Yeah. Well, you're quite right to feel very strongly about it. I mean, the workforce is our most important. It, it is absolutely crucial to the future of delivering the long-term plan. So you're absolutely right to raise what it. Are you going to well, it's not even a priority. Mm. Not in the autumn before we get a proper work. Well, I, I can assure you, it is an absolute priority. We absolutely recognise that we cannot begin to deliver the long-term plan without the workforce to do it. it. So what you're saying is absolutely true. We absolutely well, get it. I'm acknowledging that, but I don't know what can be done about it. It's too late to do anything about it now. It's going to take three years. And a massive amount of work at the very minimum to get enough nurses. Yeah. Well, the workforce is fundamentally important, and 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 actually, you've raised you've raised it actually very powerfully. So thank you. Well, thank you. I just wish you could do something about it. Right. Thank you. Um, excuse me. Don't don't rush off. Why don't you stay? Just stay and have a have a chat outside the meeting. Just just don't just hang on for a minute. Good, I think that finishes the meeting. Yeah. Good, thank you.